Car coming. Right, we're off, we're off. Good morning, good morning, good morning, how are you? Oh dear, I don't know why I'm recording this stuff because it never gets posted. I need a quantum computer to upload the amount of videos I'm creating. But at least they'll be on my hard drive for someone to delete. <coughs> so, how are you? I hope you're well. I'm very well. Back from holiday. Day three. Day one and two went very well. Day two, did two crown preps. Perfect impressions. Fitted two crowns, fitted perfectly. Although one of them was, uh, one of them was possibly a... Uh, 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 perf a perforation, a root perforation from a post, but because it was a lateral incisor and they're you know they're notoriously difficult to not to perforate. By which I mean you know you're going to get like a one in a thousand perforation rate and not much you can do about it. So. Uh, Yeah, we've done done a lot of interesting dentistry. Had a chap in who had uh, two central incisors with extremely broad uh, canals, so they'd obviously had a bang when he was young. And someone had had a sort of half-assed attempt to root treat the upper left one, and hadn't had uh, the, uh, the GP points that were thick enough, or any training in lateral condensation or anything. Hello, what's all this? What's going on? More taxpayers' money being spent on something. So um, anyway, both of these uh, central incisors had uh, a periapical uh, bone loss, and so they were both infected. And in fact, in fact one of them, the upper left one, uh, had a bit of fibrous uh, tissue over the top of the apex. And I was a bit worried that that one uh, might have been uh, broken because obviously if they've had a bang then they could have broken, couldn't they? But we've taken several x-rays and uh, can't see a fracture. So I said to him, if you want to save these two front teeth, you know, they need to be root treated properly. So he came in and we root treated them properly and um, we're going to put four crowns across the front because two, just two crowns on his front teeth are going to be very difficult to colour match. This is the worst bend on the entire road, or one of the worst bends. So, this is going to cause chaos. Especially as it's a three way junction. Anyway, I'll have to come home the other way, you know, the fast way down the, um, down the dual carriageway. So, we did that, and then that, that all went pretty well, except that uh, we've got this um, apex locator and uh, on the um, upper, uh, I forget which one it was now, anyway, on one of them it gave us a perfect reading of 19.5 millimetres to the apex and on the other one um, we had to do an old fashioned diagnostic and I put a 60 reamer up there and uh, confirmed that that was 19.5. Uh, You saw him waving, didn't you? It's not my fault. That's the thing that strips the road off. So they're resurfacing the road. Oh, jolly good. So um, anyway, so the apex locator started going mad about halfway up the tooth. When that, what that means is it's telling you the. Um, the distance to the um, perforation or the fracture rather than the distance to the apex. So, um, but we refilled it anyway on the basis that it's uh, asymptomatic and um, I suppose I should have some sort of light on, it's actually very dark. We're a week away from the uh, shortest day. So what else can I tell you? Yeah, so anyway, some interesting dentistry, and uh, the place uh, it's all gone right, right really well. 
what's what's gone rather less well is this uh, stupid woman that's taken me to uh, it's gone to dental law partnership over the the root treatment she had done just in case i haven't posted that video yet i did a root treatment on someone on an upper left six and uh, um, it was uncomfortable by which I mean, every time I told her, she was like, oh, thank you, Mr. Watson, you've done such a wonderful job. And uh, uh, and the pain was only ever, at its most, two out of ten, you know, and I reckon it's probably settled down by now. But anyway, um, she went to see a local, uh, at my recommendation, she went to see a local, another dentist, just to, uh, who was supposed to reassure her that everything was fine and it would settle down. And he then uh, pointed out that we gone uh, filled the uh, platelet canal through the uh, apex of the tooth and um, so she, uh, she then went to dental law partnership to uh, find out whether or not it had been we've been negligent in carrying out the work and they then uh, completely ignored uh, complaint which was a mildly uncomfortable root treatment and alleged that uh, the fact that this tooth needed to be root treated should have been spotted earlier. <coughs> so basically, um, you know, based on the x-rays. And as a result, that uh, we'd been negligent in doing it both late and in, improperly. So anyway, you know, I mean, the whole thing is a shakedown. That's for, if, if this happens to you, okay, I was the dental advisor for a indemnity uh, policy called uh, Dental Shield run through Lockton uh, in London and um, you know so obviously I've seen this a lot and it's a bit different when it happens to you you know you get a bit more annoyed but um, obviously I've had to deal with the dentists who were who were annoyed so I know how annoyed they got and you know now I'm feeling the same but and you have to say to them look you know this is just a shakedown Dental Law Partnership have got this niche in the market, this gap in the market. It's only really big enough for one law firm. And so what they do is they pick up all the alleged negligence business. And uh, they're very good at it in that they are, they're not, uh, they've got no moral compass, <laughs> but they have, they're slick in that they're very efficient and uh, they know how to get uh, squeeze a few thousand pounds out of your indemnifiers by just making a load of allegations and, and knowing full well that it's in your interest just to say all right then have a bit of money if you go away um, so what my indemnifiers come back and said look you know if we give them a bit of money to go away will you be happy with that and I said yeah fine as far as I'm concerned I don't know how much money they're going to accept they're, it's a, there's a, they're in a bit of jeopardy because they, you have to make it in the form of what they call a Part 36 offer, which means that um, should they go decide to reject it and go to court and eventually be awarded less, they will be in deep doo doo because uh, they'll get nothing, they'll get the lesser amount and no order for costs. So, in other words, the, the court will take a dim view of anyone who wastes their time in uh, obtaining. A judgment which is less than they've already been offered so um, they've got to think long and hard about uh, whether or not to turn it down I think they've I think we've offered them 8,000 which is you know in my opinion is about 7,500 too much <laughs> so, <laughs> but you know by, by which I mean it's 7,500 more than they deserve and uh, you can't put a condition on it that says uh, you know, we're going to put this £8,000 in trust and one of the conditions of the trust paying out is that it's it's paid out on the things that you claim that you're going to need, such as uh, extraction, uh, sinus lift and uh, implant and then in possibly in 10, 15 years time another implant. What, what you do is you just say, um, oh look, there's a kestrel up there. Is, um, all you all you can do is say well uh, okay we accept that you know based on your list of what you say you're going to need uh, 8,000 is what we are prepared to pay you and then uh, you know so then she gets the money we get a piece of paper saying that uh, they withdraw their allegation of negligence and um, she goes off to the Maldives 
and carries on chewing on the tooth that, uh, which you know by now will have settled down and, and there's nothing wrong with so uh, it's just a game you know it's just a game and that's how I used to say and that's how my indemnifier said to me uh, they did a, a video cast about uh, three months ago and they said look you know you have to understand don't take it personally it's you know half the half the population's got an IQ of less than 100 a lot of them can't read and write they don't know you know and this this woman was one of these people that had a 45 minute appointment and spent 40 minutes of that telling me how uh, fluoride was a poison and every dentist she's ever been to has been negligent and uh, there was a very real risk that we weren't going to accept her I mean a serious risk we were we were very much in two minds about whether to take her on but um, we felt that although the patient was complicated the clinical job itself wasn't you know it was basically it was a molar root treatment and so um, So, so we decided to take her on. So, I mean, and this is one of those cases where you know we would have been better off looking at it overall the situation and thought, well, you know, I mean, even the simplest job, I mean, even a scale and polish can turn into a negligence claim if the patient's a, a bit mental, you know. And if she hadn't spent 45 minutes going on telling us about. Uh, how uh, fluoride was so poisonous and she'd rather spend money on going on holiday than uh, having her teeth done. Um, we might have had a bit more time to look at her x-ray, a spot that she needed her root filling a bit earlier than, uh, or you know, in the way that was alleged. Although I still don't think we, we you know, the few months that her root treatment was delayed, even assuming you accept that, we could have seen it on the x-ray and, and would have done a root treatment based on what we saw. Uh, I don't accept that that made any difference to the outcome. But of course my lawyers do know that and that's about the only legal defence you've got, you know, which is that things would have turned out the same way whether you had carried out the alleged negligence or not. So, anyway, so... Um, Hopefully that's all the water under the bridge. I don't know what it's going to do to my uh, insurance policy payment next year. It may be that they'll bump up the premium. <coughs> I suppose they've got to get the money back somehow. You know, I mean, it's all very well saying I've got an indemnity policy that's got no copay, therefore it doesn't make any difference to me. But then that's only relevant if you're about to retire. Uh, you know, I had an associate who's retired, moved to America, and uh, had about four claims against him. And of course, he doesn't care because he's not going to pay any more indemnity policy payments ever. So, as far as he's concerned, it is free. But for me, it's not free. I mean, I uh, pay every year, don't I, into a policy fund which pays out and. Uh, But I think that obviously they um, adjust the premiums as well, you know, depending on the number of claims you've had. They might not do, I don't know, I'll find out. I've got no control over that. It's not worth worrying about things over which you have no control. Except to mitigate the outcomes. best outcome would be that they turn the £8,000 down, go to court, the court orders them, gives them an award of 300 quid, and um, they uh, get to pay their own legal fees and my legal fees. But that won't happen. Anyway, what else? So Tuesday was fairly uh, slack, that was alright. Wednesday, now we've got the staff party tonight, oh my god. My staff party's not where they used to be. Oh my. Staff, dental staff parties, when the staff and the dentists are reasonably young, can be a bit, uh, you know, more lively affairs. Now, what we do, we like to have a dinner. There's a, me and my wife, my nurse, my receptionist, 
I mean, we sit down and we have a nice meal and a, uh, a couple of pints or a couple of glasses of wine and then we all go home, you know. But uh, it's still something to look forward to. And we're going to a nice place, a little gastro pub. And uh, I, shall have a, I shall have a little drink. Yeah, the clouds are very uh, odd. We've got sort of a strato. Stratus. Very similar to the... Uh, it sort of looks like it might be blue in places, but I don't think... I think it is just a flat pancake of cloud over the top. Good for the lighting though. Yes, yes. Ah, ah, ah. We're, um, as a practice, we tend to run on time. And uh, that's a conscious decision to do that, you know, rather than, uh, I think a lot of uh, dentists think that they're uh, Just a, my favourite expression, just a sock in the tumble dryer of life when it comes to working. And certainly I think as an associate, um, as someone as employed associates, you can get a problem with associates running late. And um, the solution to that is to go to the associates and say, look, uh, and, and, and it always comes, actually the problem, the complaint comes from the reception and the reception complain because the patients complain and the patients complain to the reception they don't complain to the dentist they don't say you're running late or you know or, you know or, so what happens is the receptionist or the head receptionist will come to you and you say look that new associate is a nightmare they're always running I don't know it could be anything hour and a half late you know and the staff uh, you know it's causing a lot of problems so what you do then is you go and you say to the uh, associate, uh, you need to run on time. Now, it may be that the associate is trying to cram too much in, you know, and sometimes the, the sort of the greed of the uh, accumulated, in the old days, the fees, or now the points, may lead them to uh, book in an unrealistic number of jobs so that they are, by the end of the day, they are well, well behind because they or they'll try and attempt too much, you know, they'll try and attempt to do the whole route treatment instead of just initiate it and then temporise or <coughs> whatever. So um, <clears throat> let's just say, for example, that you say to the associate, look, you know, you're running late and they say, oh yeah, well, uh, you know, I had a lot of emergencies in, blah, blah, blah. But the, the problem still doesn't result. So it's still not running on time. And by, by on time, I mean on time. I don't mean like someone who sees everybody at five minutes past 11 for an 11 o'clock appointment is, is any better than someone who sees an 11 o'clock at 12. You have to see an 11 o'clock patient at 11, all right? You don't see them before 11 because if, let's say you've got a cancellation and, uh, you know, a quarter to 11, you're free and, and the nurse says, oh, Mrs. So-and-so is parked outside in her car shall we give her a ring or go out and knock on her window and tell her that she can come in early if she wants to because we're sitting waiting for her and she's sitting waiting for us well in general that's not a good idea I would do that say for the last patient of the day if it meant that you could then otherwise get home early or you could get off for lunch early or something but in general it's not a good idea and that's because Mrs so-and-so who came in 15 minutes early uh, and then got seen 15 minutes early, will then definitely come in 15 minutes early next time and expect to be seen. You know, she'll pick, she'll think, oh, well, that's the way they work. They're, they're giving us a 15 minute buffer, but if you turn up early, you can get in early. And that's not always the case, obviously. And there's nothing more disappointed than the voice of a patient where they ring up and they say, oh, I'm, I'm here at 11.30 for my uh, 12 o'clock appointment. I'm just parked outside. And you say, uh, oh, okay, that's great, lovely, thanks for letting us know, I'll see you at 12. And they're like, oh, okay. <laughs> You're like, yeah, 12 o'clock appointment, 12 o'clock, you know. So don't build up their expectations because you can't always see them early. You don't want to see them early, that's chaotic. And they'll just turn up earlier and earlier. I mean, if you always, if you, let's say for in theory, you do leave yourself a 15 minute buffer, 
and so you do routinely take in patients 15 minutes early they'll start turning up half an hour early or an hour early or something or whatever you know so <clears throat> So, so you've got your associate, and your associate is uh, running late, so you've had a complaint from reception, and, and you go and have a chat with your associate, and they give you a load of all blah, 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 blah. And, um, and uh, so you say to the reception, look, keep an eye on them, I'm gonna give them a week to see if they can uh, mend their ways. And then uh, the reception said, no, it's just the same, he's, you know, he's, he's decided he's gonna do things his way and not your way, and, and so and the patient's still He's still running late. And, and normally also they'll say, you know, like, she's not fair on the nurses, they work all day. They then clean the surgeries up and then they expect to be away by five or 5.30 and every day they're here till six. And it's not, you know, and okay, it's, there's no amount of money you can pay a nurse to be treated like that. They've all got uh, dinners to get on when they get home, children's homework to help with, you know, they want to be with their family. So they want to get away on the dot and that's fair enough. So then you then got to go to the associate and say, look, uh, you know, obviously this is still not right. You know, you're still not finishing on time. So we're going to have to do something, you know, to try and sort this problem out. So um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to cut down on the number of patients that you've got, right? So let's just say, take the argument, let's say they're seeing 20 patients a day. You say, look, on your average, you book in 20 patients a day, but you're obviously running horrendously late. So we'll cut it down to 15 and see how it goes. Oh well, you should see their face when you say that. You know? I mean, that is that is that is a breach of two principles of associateship, as far as they're concerned. One is that they should be allowed to do what the hell they like, and the other one is that uh, they should be allowed to see as many patients as they want. So when they realise that uh, he who controls the reception controls the surgery. Um, They're going to um, now. Now, also on the other side, obviously you have to like, try and understand what is uh, causing them to run late. So, for example, I mean, let's say root, root fillings, right? They may not understand that you can, if things are not going well. For example, if a anaesthetic's not worked or patient's very nervous or something, it is quite okay just to open uh, a tooth and not even stick a reamer down the canals, but just put some uh, crestophene and cavit and uh, uh, on cotton wool and that, and, and just bung it up and let it marinate in a bit of a parachlorophenol uh, for a week or two, you know, or a month or two. And of course, the patients then are gonna go from complaining about um, uh, being seen late to complaining that they're not getting their work done. <coughs> because, let's say your patient comes in and they need three fillings. They don't want to take any time off work. They don't want to spend a minute more in the dentist than they need to. They basically would like you to have a magic wand, although they don't, you know, they think that, although they don't, they know, how can I put it, they sort of, um, turn a blind eye to the uh, impossibility of what they want. They just want it. So they want you to do everything uh, yesterday, preferably yesterday morning, because yesterday afternoon would be too late. And so when you get them in and say, look, you know, you've booked, a, you've booked in, you can always say you've booked in 45 minutes for this appointment. I can get one of your fillings done. Which one do you want done? And they're, oh, aren't you going to do all three? No, I've got. There's no. I can't do 40, three fillings in 45 minutes. But I can do. I can do one, whichever one you like. The worst one. So what can they do? I mean, obviously they've got no. Uh, you know, I mean they can only have done what you, uh, obviously volunteered to do. So. Um, so then. Once your associate realises that they can volunteer to do less than uh, you know the patient needs or wants, and once they realise that um, 
I mean, it literally takes less than a minute to put your tools down and stick a bit of uh, crestfeed on cotton wool and cab it in, a, in an access cavity. And then also that they need to start thinking about finishing up about five to ten minutes before the next patient's due in. Because, um, you know, the patient's going to want to have a quick chat about what you've done and what you're going to do next time and blah, blah, blah. And so, you know, if the next patient's due in at 11, don't start finishing at 2 minutes to 11. You know, start finishing at 5 minutes to 11, 10 minutes to 11, depending on what you're doing. And if you do that, um, and if you get a reputation for running on time, that will really, really enhance your value, your perceived value to the patients. Because uh, a lot of people, their time is, is just as valuable as yours. And to keep someone waiting is uh, disrespectful, unless it is a genuine emergency. And the, you'll find that the more you keep people waiting, the less they'll be tolerant of it. The more you run on time, the more tolerant they will be of the very rare occasions where you do have an emergency and you have to say to someone, I'm ever so sorry, it's quite unusual, we've had an emergency, we're going to be another 15 minutes, you know. So, um, one of the side effects of running on time is that the patients start turning up on time. Because if you, uh, let's say you routinely run 20, no less than 20 minutes late, the patients routinely will start turning up no less than 20 minutes after their appointment time. Because they know, they've been trained that uh, that 20 minutes, if they turn up on time, will be spent looking at your dog-eared magazines. And <clears throat> when the receptionist says, oh, Mr. Smith, uh, you know, your appointment was 11 o'clock, then they will say, you know, you, you have kept me waiting uh, hours <laughs> over the last few years. And you never run on time, and so therefore, I'm, you know, I don't see why, how you can now shout at me for not turning up on time. <coughs> of course, it's unfortunate. If that is the one time that you are running on time, then... And you have to be careful. For example, the... Uh, uh, if you uh, quite frequently reschedule appointments because you've changed uh, sessions, you know, or dentist accounts or whatever, then it's quite difficult to berate patients for, for cancelling at short notice. If you do a lot of cancelling at short notice, then the patients will, will realise and they will get very upset if you then berate them for cancelling at short notice, especially if, especially if in the past, you've charged them for cancelling a short notice and you make absolutely no, uh, you know, give them no leeway at all when they need to cancel a short notice. Now the trick is obviously never to cancel a short notice or without the patient's consent. And we always ring the patients up if we do need to change them and say, look, I need to ask you a favour. You know, I've got a doctor's appointment or something at three o'clock same time that you're booked in but I wonder if we can just put you back half an hour is that okay is that okay and then the patient will then say yes or no or usually because they're quite nice like that they say no I don't mind I'll come another day or, or whatever but the point is it's done with their consent but you can't uh, they then won't complain and of course if you're genuinely sick then they shouldn't complain. But um, my, our system of getting people to pay in advance obviously does put us in the driving seat when they ring up. But since it's worked so well, we're like, um, we're able to be a little bit more, uh, give them a bit more latitude. You know, like I had someone ring up the other day and say, I've got tonsillitis. I'm happy to come in, but do you want me to come in and give you tonsillitis? No, I haven't got any tonsils but they don't know that. But the point was that I was able to say, no, look, we'll, we'll reschedule that, you know, because I'm not worried about losing money because they've already paid in advance. So 
So, uh, if, and you know, and it's like not a massive deal for us. Anyway, so what have I done? I've covered running late, and I've covered that other thing that I covered before I covered running late. Okay, I'll put it in the uh, in the description. All right, you have a nice day. Bye.